There's a story about two rabbis who lived in the late 1700s. There's a man named uh, Ra- Rabbi Dovber, and he lived with his family. He lived with his, his wife and his kids, and he also lived with his father, Rabbi Schneer. Now, his father lived on the second floor. He, he lived upstairs. And as the tale is told, uh, one night, Rabbi Dov Bear was meditating on scriptures as he normally would do. He would meditate on the scriptures until late in the night, sitting there by the flickering candlelight. Well, while he was immersed in study and in meditation, his youngest child fell out of her crib and started crying. But he had no clue. He didn't hear the cry of, of his child. He was engrossed. He was, he was in it, right? Laser-like focus. He was in deep and could hear nothing. But his father, Rabbi Schneer, he heard something. And he lifted his gray head and he turned his ear because the cry of a child came up through the floorboards. And so he got up and he went downstairs and he walked into the nursery and there on the floor was, was the poor little child crying. And so he goes and he picks the child up and he begins shushing and singing and his body swaying until this young one eventually falls tenderly asleep. And so he puts the child back in her crib and he says a blessing over the little one and he leaves the nursery and he walks across the hall to his son's study. And he opens the door and his son is deep in thought, deep in meditation and he walks closer and eventually the son looks up and the son and the father make eye contact. And Rabbi Schneer spoke spoke gently to his son and said, no matter how lofty your involvements, you must never fail to hear the cry of a child. Might be a legend, likely a legend, but it's a moving story. It's a moving story that we would do well to to think about for some time. Um, But why do I tell this to you? Just to tug on some heartstrings, you know, to pull you into a sermon, to make some kind of point. Why do I tell this to you? Well, it's because I, I wonder, as you hear that story, I wonder, as you hear that story, which one of those fathers do you know? Which one of those fathers do you most identify with? Do you most identify with the father who doesn't hear the cry, who is too busy doing his thing, who is is absent? Is that the father you know from your experience? Or do you most identify with the father who hears the cry, who gets up, who comes downstairs and tends to the need with tender love and mercy? Is that the father you know? Which father do you know? Father. Now, when that word is spoken, no doubt the responses within and across this room are varied, and maybe maybe they're at odds, they're conflicting. There's a vast array of uh, emotions that arise, if you really sit to think about it. Different memories arise, different experiences arise when I say Father. And for some of you, honestly, it is the ultimate trigger word. For some of you, there is a, a trauma response that occurs. Suddenly, you're uncomfortable in your own skin. Guilt and shame and fear become visceral when you hear that word. And if that's you, my friend, I'm sorry for that. There's good news. There's there's really good news ahead. Know that there is the brightness of healing in the gospel of Jesus for you. Now, for others of us, maybe it's it's sweet memories that that arise. There's a tenderness. There, there's a uh, the feeling of a present father who cares that, that, that invades your body and, and your mind when you hear the word father. And maybe for a lot of us, it's just really mixed. 
It's just kind of all of that somehow put together. Well, wherever we are in relation to that word father, wherever we are in relation to our own earthly father, it's clear in scripture and it's abundantly clear that this idea of God as father is incredibly important to Jesus, incredibly important to Jesus. Jesus wants us to know God as Father. And so it's no wonder that the Apostles' Creed begins this ancient, long-loved statement of faith, this ancient and globally agreed-upon distillation of what it means to trust in God. It's no wonder that this creed begins with the following words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And so today, that is the statement that we are going to be looking at. That's the precious gem that we're going to be turning around and around in the light of the, the scriptures today. So by way of brief reminder, if you weren't here last week, what is a creed? Well, a creed is simply a, a distilled statement of what we believe, what we believe in about God, what we believe about reality. The word creed it comes from a Latin word, credo, which means I believe or I believe unto or into. In other words, uh, it's, it's what I trust in. It's not simply mental assent to some kind of fact. It's not just agreeing with some kind of fact, you know, through cognition. Uh, but it is, uh, it's an, a pledge of a allegiance, a commitment of affection and action. So trust, by the way, is always embodied, right? Trust is always, <clears throat> always, always embodied. So that's what we looked at last week. And by the way, last week, um, I should have said this uh, because, you know, this is a whole new topic for some of us. For some of us, we've heard about the Apostles' Creed. Others of us have no idea at, at all about it. So there's a lot of really good resources. So there's a, a whole stack. You guys can come up here after service if you want. If you're interested in the background of, of the Apostles' Creed, um, there's a lot of these books. I mean, they're almost all called the Apostles' Creed, but I got J.I. Packer, uh, which has been fantastic. Our common group leaders have that one. Uh, a book by Ben Myers, which is awesome. Uh, A.W. Tozer book, R.C. Sproul, uh, Tim Chester. There's a lot of books on the Apostles' Creed, and we've been going through those in prep for this. So um, they've been incredibly helpful. So if you want to know those, please stop by afterwards, and I'd love to talk with you about that. Lastly, before we move further into uh, what we're going to look at today, um, we're going to be reciting the creed together at the end of this message, okay? So we'll do it together at the end of this message. So with that said, uh, today, uh, top billing, the starting line of the creed is about God the Father, God the Almighty Father. What do we believe about God as Father? What do we believe about God as Father? What we believe about God as Father is incredibly, incredibly important. So author theologian J.I. Packer says this in, his fall, in, the, in the, the classic book, Knowing God. Here's what it says. He writes, what is a Christian? What's a Christian? The question can be answered in many ways, but the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as Father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity... Find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. The creed agrees, or rather, J.I. Packer agrees with the creed. And that's why the creed puts forward this most important fact on the front end that, that God is our almighty father. He is the maker of heaven and earth. Well, that's what J.I. Packer says. That's what the creed says. But what do the scriptures say? And that's, that's what we're concerned about is what do the scriptures teach? So we're going to talk about that here. Um, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, which is the first, if you're new to the Bible, if you're new to church, the Old Testament is basically the first two-thirds of, of the Bible. It's, it's before Jesus came, um, before the Son of God came to earth as Jesus the Son. And so the Old Testament says a number of things about God as Father. So first, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Uh, I have these up on the screen. I'll just read through some of these briefly. God says, Israel is my firstborn son. And then he says, let my son go. Who's he talking to? Let my son go. The Pharaoh, right? Let my son go. He's bringing the people out of slavery. Then in Deuteronomy, another book in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 14, 1 through 2, it says, you are the sons of the Lord your God. He's talking to the people of Israel. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So Israel is a son, and 
God is a father. Then you move over to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 63, verse 16. We hear these words. For you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. And then if you go to the last book, uh, at least in our version of the the Bible, the last book is Malachi, and that's uh, chapter 2, verse 10. It says, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? So I I highlight each one of these, and there's more. We don't have time to go through them all. But I highlight these to say that the underlying idea in the Old Testament and seen in these passages is that God is the father of a covenant people. God is the father of Israel. Why? Because of the special covenant, because of what God has done for these people. These passages aren't saying that God is the father of, of all people. He's say, it's, they're saying that specifically that God is the father of, of Israel. <clears throat> now, um, interestingly, though these references to God are here in the, in the Old Testament, the Jewish people were not so keen um, on addressing God as, as father. It, was just, it, it wasn't something you, you did. It, it'd make them like bristle, Right? Out of high reverence, right? God's name is not used um, throughout the, the Old Testament. Well, it's, it's used throughout the Old Testament, but, but God's people wouldn't use the name Yahweh because it was so high and lifted up that it, it shouldn't be said to profane it. So you use the word Lord. So in a lot of these, you might have seen, see it says Lord and Lord's capitalized. Wherever Lord is capitalized there, that would be the name Yahweh. It's just not written or spoken as Yahweh. It's, it's Lord in its place. Why? Because of reverence. Because of reverence. Well, a similar thing happens with the name Father. A similar move of reverence. The word Father, it's just, I mean, it's too familiar. It's, it's too casual. It's too ordinary. It's too earthy for the God of the universe. You don't call the transcendent God who came thundering on Mount Sinai in fire and smoke Father, you don't call the one whose presence makes the the temple uh, shake and who makes Isaiah's knees buckle and his bones turn to mush. You you don't call that one Father. You don't call the transcendent God, the one who is I am. You don't call the God of the universe who the angels circle around and sing holy, holy, holy holy, you don't call that one the omnipotent one, the all-powerful one. You don't call that one with an ordinary word, a daily word, a familiar term like father. You don't call the one who made the burning stars and the spiraling galaxies and the blue whales and the ocean deeps father. You just don't do that. Or do you? See, then Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up. And when Jesus shows up, he shakes things up because that's what his his love does. And you know, Jesus is just obsessed with his father. He's attuned to his father. He's always focused on his father. He's always talking about his father. When when he's a young man, when he's about 12, uh, his family goes traveling to Jerusalem, but then he goes missing and they can't find him. And eventually they go to the temple and they find Jesus and they're upset. Like, what were you doing? And he's like, why are you wondering where I was? Why are you wondering where I was? Of course I would be in my father's house. Years later when Jesus uh, grows up and matures and he's in Jerusalem again at one point, he starts flipping tables over uh, in the temple because of the corruption and the consumerism that's blocking the love and, and mercy of God from meeting the people who, who need it. He flips these tables over and, and he says, my father's house should be a house of what? House of prayer. At one point, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders. He's talking to them about the Sabbath. And he says, my father is working until now, and so am I. At another point, uh, it tells us in the scriptures in John 5.18 that the religious leaders were seeking all the more to kill him. Because why? Because he was calling God his own father. Jesus claims that he and the father 
are one in John 10, verse 30. At another time in John, John 5, verse 19, he says, I only do what I see the Father doing. They're, they're intimately connected. And then on the cross, right? They're, they're cursing him. They're mocking him as he's dying for them in their stead. And he says, Father, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then he's about to take his last breath and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then on Easter Sunday, when he's speaking with, with Mary and, and she's seeing the resurrected Lord, he says, don't, don't, don't hold on to me because um, I, I, I haven't ascended yet to see my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Jesus can't stop thinking about his Father. This is the relationship that defines everything for him. If you were to follow Jesus around as some kind of like, you know, voyeur or, or fanboy or fangirl like around Galilee and there's the, the crowd and you were to just to hear clips and phrases, you would hear the word father so often through those bits and pieces, a high frequency of the word father. See, Jesus taught that the primary way for us to understand and relate to God is as our father, the God of the universe is our Heavenly Father. So the question before us today is, is that how we primarily relate to God? Is, is He our Father? Is He our Father? Well, <clears throat> Jesus wants this for us, and the Apostles' Creed reflects it. So let's look at our passage that we read at the start, uh, Luke 11, um, chat, verse 1 through 4. It says this. It says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say. Now, just let me pause real quick. First, one thing uh, here is Jesus is off again. He just keeps disappearing. And everyone's like, where did Jesus go? Oh, it's Jesus. Of course, he's off praying to his father. Jesus had a habit of escaping and getting away and being in the quiet place, the secret place, finding a desolate place to be with his father. He was always off praying, and he was even praying to his father when he was with others, right? He was attuned to his father. He was living a life of unceasing prayer, a life of relationship with his father. So his disciples, his apprentices, see this, so they're like, teach us, teach us that. Whatever that is that you have going on there, like, that, teach us that. So he does. So let's uh, head back into our verse here, um, second half of verse two. So here's what he says. Pray like this. Father, hallowed. Uh, I know that's religious sounding. Um, it might not mean something to us. So it just, it means holy or it means set apart or you're utterly unique, unlike anyone else. So Father, May your name be set apart, unique. May we see you as you are. May we see you as God and your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. You might know the parallel version of that. You might have memorized the Lord's Prayer from Matthew chapter 6. There's a slight, slight variation on it, as you can see. Um, but here, you know, just when I read that, uh, the response that's happening here right now tells us that we are not living during Jesus' day and age because the response that, that should happen when we hear Heavenly Father or Father, hallowed be your name should be a collective gasp and a buzz and shocked chatter in the room going, he's talking to God as Father. That would, that would shake, shake things up. See, Jesus, what, what Jesus speaks here is what Brennan Manning in a very famous sermon he said years ago um, called uh, Abba Father. Uh, what, what, what Jesus is revealing here is a revolutionary revelation. A revolutionary revelation that we are to relate to God as his people and as individuals as our heavenly father, a holy father. And what this means, what this means is that there's a radical trusting intimacy involved. And, and so look at this. Look at the incredible combinations of these words. So let's put these words up. So Father and hallowed, like we just looked at in Luke 
uh, that, that should say Luke 11, not, not 15. Luke 11, verse 2. Um, and then heavenly and Father in Matthew 6, 9, which is the parallel passage. And then in the creed, almighty and Father. Like the combination of those words is like heaven and earth just, just colliding. See, what Jesus wants us to see, what he's linking, what the creed is linking is the everyday ordinary, intimate, familiar term of Father with the transcendent, all-powerful, burning fire of a God who always was and always will be, who from him all things come and all things will go, the untamable, all-powerful, all-knowing one. Like, that's incredible. Your dad, your father is the one who oversees all existence and holds everything in his hand. What a combination of words. It should cause us pause and it should make us wonder and it should evoke, it should evoke joy. Like that's, that's your dad. I know this uh, off script. Okay, so um, you know the elementary school thing when kids are like trying to be better than each other? You know where I'm going with this already, right? And uh, Pete does. He's like, okay, here it comes. And, and someone's like, oh, yeah, well, my dad can beat up your dad. Your dad created every, every dad. Your dad is all powerful. Your dad holds everything. Your heavenly father holds everything in his mighty and holy hand. That is the Father who knows the details and sorrows and pains and joys of your life. That, that is your Father. Come on, that is good news. That is good news. So Jesus is showing us here that this term, Father, is a term of relationship that is one of radical, trusting intimacy. Radical, trusting intimacy. That is the primary relationship that we have with the God of the universe. It's a sweet and sacred, loving dependence upon him. So again, Jesus is saying that we are to relate to this all-powerful God of the cosmos with radical, trusting intimacy. God is not a cold, distant deity. God is not a celestial potentate that you have to go through a bunch of red tape just, just to get into his presence. He's not a cosmic monarch that has nothing to do with you and just kind of threw human beings into existence. He's not an absent father. He's not. He's a loving father. I mean, look at the next bit of our text. This is so great. It's a weird one, but it's awesome. Look at what he says in verse 5 uh, and then 9 through 13. So after he teaches them this, then he says this. He says, and I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. And I can just imagine Jesus smiling. It's okay to imagine as you read through some of these things. What, what father among you? What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, he will give him a scorpion. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? See, Jesus is teaching that God as our almighty father can give us all that we need. And that he's greater than the sum of all the goods of fatherhood that we know. He's the, the best father. He's the perfect father. A human father generally is not going to give their kid a scorpion if they ask for an egg. Not sure how many of your kids are asking for eggs for their birthdays, you know. Um, but you're going to give them something good. So how much better is this heavenly father, right? How much better? Because the true father is better than the best of all human fathers. You take all the goods that we see in human fathers and you take those and you turn them all the way to 11, put them all the way up in the sky to their perfection and there, there we get to see a glimpse of this God. <clears throat> a glimpse of his goodness as father. 
And I, I asked my kids a dangerous question <laughs> the other day because I often will talk to them about the sermons. Uh, and I asked them about God as Father. And I said, uh, do you guys think God's a better father than me? Uh, and they're like, yes, Dad, of course. I was like, okay, good, good theology. That doesn't hurt my feelings at all. Uh, do you think I'm a perfect father? Pff, no. Um, they said it very certainly and very rapidly. A little too certain, a little too rapid for me. And Marla was in the room and she just laughs and turns the other way. I was like, okay, that one hurt a little bit. But it's true, right? Like, certainly not a perfect father. Anyway, shape or form, us, any of us at our very best, we're just a shadow of the Father of lights. Now, I read Psalm 135 earlier. Let's bring that into the mix. Psalm 135, verse 5 through 7. The psalmist says, For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. What a statement. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven, and on earth, in the seas, and in the deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain and brings forth the wind from the storehouses. I'm so glad the Bible is riddled with poetry. It's beautiful. God is omniscient. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. The one we relate to as Father is the author of creation. He's the maker of, of heaven and earth. He's the designer of lightning and lightning bugs. He's the architect of tectonic plates and the engineer and, and the mover of, of mountains. He is the creator of embers and ice crystals. He is the artist behind gravity and the light spectrum. Like just imagine, we have intimacy with the infinite one. Let that do something to your head. <laughs> Intimacy with the infinite one. Intimacy. Now, is that an appropriate term? Should we, should we be using that term when it comes to this God? Well, Jesus calls this Father God Abba. Abba. He calls this God Abba in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, he knows what is ahead. He knows he will be hanging on a cross, and he's fully human and fully divine. And so he prays this. He prays, Abba, Abba, all things are possible for you. Remove this from me. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but your will be done. Abba. That's not just a technical term. That is calling out. That is a personal term of Abba, Father. Abba is Aramaic for Father. And what we should, I guess, understand about this word is that this is the word that was used around the house all day long. So after a long day, when Dad would come home and the kids are excited to see Dad, you know, they, they would hear the garage door go up. Right? And, and then they would run into the garage and they would cry, Abba, Abba, Abba. And they'd all talk to him at once and he'd be like, Whoa, too much, right? Or is that just me? It's like, I cannot handle all the streams of information at the same time, one at a time. Right? Well, it's the term um, for, for when a little girl wanted to play with her daddy, she would put up her arms and go, Abba. So he could pick her up and spin her around. That's the term Abba. It's, it was one of the first words that, that a child, and is one of the first words that a child will say. A child will generally, on average, begin to speak, right, around 8 to, eight to 12 months. And in English-speaking world, it's often mama or dada. But, but in, the, in the Middle Eastern world, it, it would be Abba or Ima. Um, Abba is father and Ima is is mom. There, there's an ancient text called the Babylonian Talmud, and in it it says, when a child experienced the taste of wheat, that, that is when it's weaned off of its mother's milk, it learns to say Abba or Ima. Because that's what that soft palate can say. That's what that little mouth can say. Abba is a word easy enough 
for an inarticulate, soft mouth to say, yet it carries within it the power of radical trusting intimacy that shapes and forms a world. It's a child's term. And, and I mean, this, think about it. Um, when an infant says the word Abba or, or Ima, it's because um, they understand this, this relationship um, in their way as one of radical dependent trust. Those parents are that child's whole world. Those parents are that child's whole world. That child can only eat, can only be cleaned if that parent does it, does it. So the child has a radical trusting intimacy relationship with that parent. It's not a works-based relationship. It's not a, I better not poop my pants again or else I won't get fed. It is, I cry and I get what I need. It's not works-based. It's love-born. And that is what we have with our Father. Abba. Radical trusting intimacy. And this isn't just some kind of sentimentality that brings God down a peg. It's not a lack of reverence. This is a term of deep intimacy that we were designed for as God's image bearers. Jesus is teaching us how to relate to his Father. So, with that said, um, if we are to relate to God as Father, then we also know something about ourselves. If God is our Father, then we are his what? Children. Look what Paul says in Romans 8, 14 through 17. He's talking about those who are followers of Jesus. He says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So what is he saying? Well, to be a Christian is to be an apprentice of Jesus, but it's to be a child of God. It's to be a follower of Jesus, but to be a follower of Jesus and have his spirit within you is to be a child of God because Jesus is the Son of God and he gives us the spirit of sonship. We are adopted into the family because of the, the ministry, the work of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and sending us his spirit. And so now we can relate as children to the God who oversees the fierce and gorgeous universe that is. You are Abba's child. You're Abba's child. You're Abba's child. We are Abba's children. This is good news because of the kind of father he is. Right? Remember that, that question, which father? Well, we could be Abba's child, but not, not good news given, you know, that he would be a real bad dad. But we know what kind of father is because Jesus shows us what kind of father he is. Jesus shapes our imagination about who this father truly is. Uh, there's a story that he tells. You guys will know this. There's a story that he tells. And he tells it amidst a bunch of grumbling and blindness in the leadership. The, the, the leaders are upset with Jesus because he's eating with and he's welcoming sinners. And so Jesus says, look, you know, there's this guy, and he has two sons. And there's this one, there's this one son who, man, his, his heart is just out of order. It's out of whack. He, he goes to his dad, and he's like, I don't want to be here. I don't much care for you in the way you do things. And I know you have money that's coming my way when you're in that pine box. I want the money now. In other words, Dad, I don't care if you're alive or dead. I just want your stuff so I can do the things I want to do. And so the, the father says, okay, here you go. So the son liquidates all the assets and he gets his coinage and he's off and he goes far, far to a galaxy far away. Right? 
and he lives it up. And he, he drinks it all in and he spins it all out. And eventually he's got nothing left. He tried to fill himself up, but the, the hedonism has just left his heart empty. And then there's a famine and he finds himself taking care of pigs, which is not the best job for a kosher Jew. And he wants to eat their food because that's all he has. And then at some point he comes to his senses and he's like, you know, if I were back with dad, I could at least be a slave. And if I was a slave of my father's household, I would eat better than I'm eating now. I would do better. So I'm going to go back. And so he does. He takes the long walk back home. He's, he's gaunt and thin in, in body and and in and, and soul, he's eaten up, he's, he's beaten up. And then we get this picture of a father. Jesus paints this portrait of a father. Look at Luke chapter 15, verses 20 through 24. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and ran, and embraced him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've, I've sinned against heaven, and, and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father interrupted. The father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, and kill it, and, and let us eat. Let us let us celebrate, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He is lost and he's found. And they began to celebrate. That is the portrait of your Abba. That is what he's like. He saw him when he was a long way off. He's scanning the horizon. He's looking actively for his beloved children. And he has compassion. He has literally guts of love and care and concern for his kids. And then he ran. Uh, is it cool for a Middle Eastern patriarch to run? This is not dignified. He picks up his robe and he starts bolting to, to hug his son. This, this is unthinkable. This is shame. He's taking shame on himself in order to cover the shame of his son who is loaded with it. If we're not seeing the cross of Jesus here, we're not seeing the story right. Because in Jesus, the Father, in the Son, meets humanity and covers our shame and brings us home into the feast. This is our heavenly Father that Jesus the Son reveals. And then he shares in the joy and he shares the joy all around and hosts this big old stinking party. It makes all the religious people go nuts. This is why 1 John 3.1 tells us, see what kind of love, not just that he's given us, but see what kind of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the sons of God or the children of God, and so we are. And, and by the way, when it says that the Father went out and kissed him, it's an intensive verb. It should be like, and the Father ran out, grabbed the guy so hard he could barely breathe, and he kissed him, and he kissed him, and he kissed him, and he wouldn't stop sloppily kissing him because his son was back from the dead. That is the Abba who oversees your life. It doesn't matter what kind of absent father you had, that's the true father. What kind of abusive father you had, that is the true father. We all, friends, we all have a father wound. And I don't just mean because of our earthly fathers, I mean because we have all sinned. We have all shaken our fists at heaven, said, I want your stuff, I don't care about you, I want to live the way I want, and we all eventually will hit rock bottom. We are all in a self-imposed exile from the Father. The Father's scanning the horizon, and he sends the, the true, greater elder son to come and get us. Friends, do we have a healthy view of God as, as Father, as Abba? As we close, you know, uh, here is the application if you just want to make it so blunt. 
We need to pray and learn to pray daily and sit in this. Abba, you are my heavenly father. Abba, I am your beloved child. What if instead of picking up your phone and first thing you saw was a bunch of toxic vitriol or whatever, and you sat in the quiet with him and you confess this truth, Abba, you are my heavenly father. You do all that pleases you. And Abba, I am your beloved child. Friends, put that rhythm in your life. In, in, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, say it. Live in it. Sit in it. Let's end where we began. Two rabbis. Rabbi Dov Bear and Rabbi Schneer and the crying child. I wonder, I wonder which one of the fathers in that story Jesus most likely identified with. I think I have a pretty good clue on which father he would go, ah, oh, that's the one. That's the one. Friends, as we close, we're going to read um, the Apostles' Creed together uh, again today. Uh, so would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? Um, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I know that there's some words in here that we're still trying to figure out and learn. The word Catholic in here, again, means universal, um, not the Catholic Church as we commonly think. It just means universal. Um, and there's the word hell in here, which is hard for some of us, but we're going to get into all that. But uh, we are going to uh, profess this truth together, and then we're going to take um, communion. So uh, if you are willing and able, let's speak the good news of this creed as a church family. You guys ready? Okay. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.